morning. Well, welcome to a new day in our uh, kind of crazy world. Um, I hope you're doing well. Um, even though things have been restricted and the uh, virus is kind of still un uncontrolled at this point in time. Um, but I just want to welcome you. Um, this is the first time I've ever really been through something like this. Um, I, uh, <clears throat> in Hawaii, experienced uh, tsunami threats, went through several hurricanes, and California went through a couple earthquakes where we were confined. Uh, you know, been through those things, but this whole thing with the virus, uh, that, that's a whole new ball game. And uh, the good news is I think we're in a situation here where um, we have an opportunity. Um, Jesus is always in control. Um, and I think that's why uh, God kind of has us in, in the book of first, in the, in the book of Philippians right now, because Paul's confined in some ways like we are. Um, but he's confined to prison. He's awaiting a uh, death sentence uh, with Caesar and a bunch of false testimonies. And uh, yet, as he sits in prison, he's not thinking about being confined. He's thinking about the unique opportunities he has to minister to the guards, um, to the Philippians through a letter and some of the other letters that are written from prison by Paul. So I think we can learn a lot from his heart um, as we continue our journey uh, through the book of Philippians. Um, we're in chapter 3 today, and uh, as Paul guides us, we want to uh, kind of look at what he has to say to us today. And uh, could we pray before we do this? Um, I desperately need God to open my eyes and my heart. Uh, Father, um, you didn't cause the virus, but you allowed the virus. You're sovereign. You're in control of all things. And sometimes the only way you can lift people's heads to you is through challenge, through things that we cannot control. Uh, and so, Father, I pray for myself, I pray for Foothills, I pray for all your other kids, that, Lord, we would really um, not look at what we can't do, but find unique ways we can do things with our neighbors, uh, through media, through phone calls. And uh, so, Lord, would you just uh, encourage us through Paul's words and Help us continue to let you, Father, be in control of our lives rather than our circumstances. Uh, we can't do that without you, so we just ask you as we read Paul's words uh, that you would help us, uh, Father. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter 3, and um, we'll just kind of read the transition verse from Paul to what he's going to say to us today. Uh, it says, finally, my brother, so this is, uh, he's entering the second half of the letter. Um, finally, my brothers, and he's in jail, and they're going through their own challenges, and his next word is rejoice in the Lord. That is, joy is when we realize Jesus really is over us that he really is in control, that he really has our best in mind. And again, it's not this fluttery happiness. It's a sense of, I'm grateful. And um, God, thank you for who you are. And Lord, help me uh, dis dispense your hope in this season. So Paul goes on, to write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. So he's writing similar things. And so what Paul does now <clears throat> is he begins to write about his own journey, uh, his own past um, as a part of the story. And so he says this, a look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers. This is verse two. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision and the circumcision is a symbol of purity, of cleansing. 
We are the purity who worship the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, our power, our control. Um, and then he goes on and talks about his own journey toward Jesus. He says, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. I mean, Paul has been an amazing man by way of position, by way of performance, by way of authority. And um, so he knows what it is to try to be in power and in control and think you've got it um, and where that ultimately gets you. So he goes on, he says, if anyone thinks he has reason for confidence of flesh, I have more. Circumcised the eighth day, that is <clears throat> just in line with the law of Israel for every single one of his kids, for males especially. Um, of the people of Israel, God's chosen people, uh, God's people that he loved and, and made a tool. Uh, of the tribe of Benjamin, one of the 12 tribes, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. You know, if you look at me, uh, I'm at the top of the line when it comes to Jewish people. I was one of the leaders. And he goes on and says, <clears throat> as to the law, a Pharisee. And in the Jewish culture, uh, you had different kinds of leaders. A Pharisee was the most legalistic, most adherent to every single letter of the law. Sadducees were more liberal, and they didn't do that kind of stuff. So Paul says, when it comes to the law, man, I was spot on. I was, I was right there, keeping everything. As to zeal, as to commitment and fervor, I was a persecutor of the church. Man, I was, I was so in that I was willing and desired and gave my life to destroy anything that came against the nation of Israel and the teaching of Moses. As to righteousness under the law, I was blameless. Man, I, ju I just kept the whole law. And uh, I, I, was, I was all in. And so Paul gives his own background. And uh, one of the tendencies for all of us is to be self-confident, to be in power, to be in control, um, and that it's all about us and how we are working our way through. And um, I don't know about you, but that's called the flesh, and I wrestle with that all the time. So what Paul is talking about here, we've all been there. We may not have had his Jewish background, but we have this self-control, uh, shame or blame mindset that is all anchored in us. And we, we always want other people's affirmation. Man, I do. That's, that's one of my huge weaknesses. Um, we want control. <clears throat> we want to know what's going on. We don't want anybody to do something that doesn't go along with what I think is best. Uh, man, that, that's just the thing we wrestle with. It's a reality. And so Paul talks about that that's where he came from. And that's more of a religious mindset. Uh, religion is always anchored in self. It's all about me and how I can perform and uh, achieve respect and acceptance. And uh, Paul says, that, that's where I came from. And um, I don't know about you, but I understand uh, that mindset. Uh, but then he goes on and he calls us to, because that kind of stuff just fades. It's not worth anything. It, it causes conflict. A self-centered life causes conflict, right? Because it's all about me. You know, if, if you remember Finding Nemo, uh, all the seagulls, when Nemo was tossed onto the deck, all the seagulls were arguing over who get to eat him. And, and that's so many times what our culture is like. And uh, Paul says it's, it's, it, it, it's the heart of what causes conflict and war is a self-centered mindset. And so Paul then calls us to a whole different thing, a whole different place to anchor our hope and our security and our confidence in. And so he goes on, and most of you are very familiar with this, but whatever gain I had, 
whatever trophies I had, whatever pictures on the wall, whatever awards I had, I counted as loss. I basically go, this, this is worth nothing compared, compared for the sake of Christ. Everything I have counted but loss. Everything that I performed, all my trophies, all my sources of security and significance, it, it was worth nothing when it came to understanding who Christ was. And Silly goes on to say this, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Mm. If you were to look at your heart right now, Where is Jesus when it comes to being the one you want to please more than anything else in this season of your life? Uh, we all struggle with that. There's always distractions. But that's what he says. The surpassing worth of knowing Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things. And it's just rubbish. It doesn't last. It all decays. It all goes away. Uh, I've probably told you this story about a friend of mine who got an Oscar award. And I was over visiting him at his house. And he says, hey, you want to see the award I got, the Oscar? And he pulls out the drawer, and here's the stand, and here's the Oscar. It fell off. And he keeps it in this part of his drawer that has all kinds of other trash. It, it became worthless as he came to know Jesus. It, it really didn't do anything to bring power and glory permanently and sufficiency and a sense of peace to his life. So Paul says, I count everything as lost because of surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count it as rubbish. And be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, performance-oriented stuff, all the awards we get for performance, whether we're Jewish or any other thing we do. <clears throat> but I want to be found with that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Only in Christ are we made totally okay and right? Yeah, you know how it is when things are right? Uh, you know, when your car's in tune, uh, when your relationship with your spouse is good, uh, when you're all kind of lined up, that rightness is just, there's nothing better than that. And Paul says, through Jesus, I've been made completely right with God completely right with God. So where does that lead to as we do life? He says, <clears throat> and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ Jesus, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. And then he goes on and talks about where that goes from here. That we've been made right that we may know him. The first thing God wants, the first thing Jesus wants is relationship. It's not about religion. It's not about heaven. It's about relationship. That we would know him. That we would know the beauty of him being involved in as all he is in our lives. And we, we did it last week. We kind of unpacked Christ. He's our creator and sustainer. The H is he's our healer, our forgiver. The R, he's our restorer. He's always going to lift us back up. He's always going to bring us back. And one day it's going to be complete. He's our intercessor. Man, when we need stuff, 
he invites us to come as we are, dirty and stumbling and whatever, and just come through the door and receive whatever God makes available through Jesus. He loves being interceding. He loves being there for us. He doesn't go, oh, no, not again. And then it goes on and says he's our shepherd. He knows where you are right now. He knows what you're struggling with. He knows what you need. And he's interceding for the Father. And uh, Psalm 23 is a great place to go. Just be reminded of what kind of shepherd heart the Father has for us, especially in this season. Uh, Not easy. And then he's a truth teller. Uh, He's not into just saying things that we can receive easily. He tells the truth because the truth sets us free. Deception and lying and all that stuff doesn't. It just it just entangles us in Satan's ways. And, and, and God wants us free. So the first thing that happens is Paul turns to the Father and he's made right with the Father. He has a relationship with Jesus and, and he gets to know him more and more and more. And the second thing he talks about is that we also get to know the power of the resurrection. What does that mean? The resurrection of Christ, what does that do for us? First of all, it demonstrates that God has the ultimate power and authority over the thing that controls everything, that is Satan and death and destruction. It doesn't win. Death does not win. For a believer, death is a doorway to have it. And so he says he has the power of the resurrection. There's hope in him. It also gives us a sense of power and boldness to be able to say no to sin and selfishness. Um, through the Holy Spirit, through the resurrection of, the, of Christ, that we have the Spirit, we have the power to do what we cannot do on our own. And that is to say no. And to say yes to the Father in, in, the midst, in, in the midst of really hard times. And uh, we've got the power. All we need to do is submit to it. Uh, it says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you. So we have everything we need in this season and forever to live purposeful lives. And then Paul goes on and shares another thing that he's grown into in relationship to Jesus. And that is the fellowship of the suffering of Christ. That I may share in his sufferings. Uh, That is, Jesus not only invites us into his life, he also invites us into his mission. What's the mission? That what we gain from him, we give away. And we share. Hope. And that means, sometimes, uh, I know when I had cancer on my face, you know, and it was attached to the the brain thing, and I'm getting super scared, God's going, no, 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 this, this is not about you, this is about mission. I'm going to take you because of the suffering you're going through, because of this dangerous thing. I'm going to take you to connect with people that you wouldn't connect with otherwise. So get your mind off yourself and look for the opportunities that are come and come your way. My brother's experiencing the same thing right now with cancer on his bladder. He's looking at it as an opportunity, not opposition, not as a problem. And so we are called to step into suffering at times. We live in a broken world. And if I want to keep my hands totally clean all the time, now we need to be wise because we don't want to be the cause of the problem. But we also want to reach out and step into other people's suffering. That's why I love going to Haiti or uh, kind of Nehemiah House in the Philippines where there's a bunch of abused girls. Or hang out with my buddy in Thailand who rescues kids that have been abandoned by their parents. And and the question is, 
what, what is God going to, what doors is he going to open up to move into our community? I mean, even right now, uh, I texted all my neighbors, say, hey man, how can I be praying for you? And uh, is there anything I can do for you? Is there any way I can help in a safe way? I mean, this opens the door for us to step in and have a common ground in ways never before. Um, so our suffering is a bridge to ministry, to growth, and dependence on Jesus in ways that we never, ever would go to on our own. And then he closes out with, and becoming like him in his death, <laughs> uh, dying to self. Mm, not a favorite thing for most of us, is it? The suffering thing invites us to not be about us, to die to self so we can give our way to others. And then the ultimate is that by any means possible, I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Paul's ultimate goal is, man, where does this whole story end? As I live into Christ and I get to know the powers of resurrection and step into his suffering and the suffering of others. Where does it end? Resurrection. Triumph. A world where there is no more pain, there is no more suffering. But I've got to be willing to walk through it with others in order to embrace the heart of Jesus and follow his example. Otherwise, I'm not a follower of him. I may be a believer in him, but I'm not a follower of him. And uh, so Paul gives us a, a huge challenge that we might know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, and one day <laughs> we, we get to all be standing in heaven. And then the cool thing Paul says as he shifts, he says, uh, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus had made me his own. So the challenge always in our Christianity is not to, not to leave it out there and just believe in it, but it's to embrace it and make it us. Make Jesus us. And so Paul says, and he goes on and says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. It's a journey, right? It's a journey, one step at a time. It's like a hike to Mount Rainier. You don't get there overnight. You take one step at a time. Where are you today? What's the next step you need to take? He says, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do. And here's a key for us at Foothills in a season of transition. It's really key. One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. Yesterday's gone. We can appreciate what's gone. We can, all that stuff, but I need to forget it. I need to let go of it. I need not to drag it with me into the future. And then he goes on and says this, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Letting go of where I am that I might go to where God wants me to go in and through this season by way of maturity, by way of heart, by way of submission to Jesus, by way of developing more and more of a servant's heart that's not about me, but it's about others. And Paul puts it this way as he closes out this part. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And then he speaks to all of us. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Good words for us. Focusing on Jesus in this season. To know him, the powers of resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, that one day we might experience total redemption and we might understand the resurrection 
but for now, how are we doing with Jesus? How are we living into the words of Paul? Seeking to grow in knowing him. Seeking to let his power control our lives. Seeking to lean into whatever is in front of us. Good, bad, or ugly. As an opportunity, not as an obstacle. And sometimes we have to think in new and fresh ways in order to keep moving forward. But the coronavirus isn't going to last. <clears throat> it's just an opportunity. It's just a bridge. And so as a fellowship, how are we going to do that? And so today as we close, and I'm, this prayer is just for me as well, um, what fresh steps can I take? in following Jesus, in believing in his power and letting his power control what I do, and being willing to step into other people's problems, be willing to embrace my suffering because God's using that like a fire is used to melt gold so the junk comes to the surface so the gold can be purified. That's the good news about suffering for us. It's not a destroyer, it's a purifier. So as uh, I close, can we uh, just, just pray for each other? Um, thank you for allowing me to be a part of your family. You are family. And um, anyways, let's do it. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your heart. Thank you for your wisdom. And Lord, as we walk through this strange season, we just ask that, Lord, we would know you. We would know your power and we would know the fellowship of your suffering. You stepped into our suffering intentionally to help us grow, to relieve us, to free us. And Lord, may we do the same as we deal with our own and deal with others, especially in this season, God. <clears throat> as you have not caused this coronavirus, but you've allowed it Lord, I believe there's a bigger kingdom purpose here. And so help us lift our heads above the fear and look into the purpose and the opportunities that you give us each day, one day at a time. So Father, I pray that you would bless and encourage each one of my brothers and sisters at Foothills and anybody else who's listening. Lord, that uh, we may move forward with a peace and a confidence to be salt and light in this crazy world, in this very needy time. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hope you have a good week. Thank you. Love you guys.